Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and for this nice introduction. Uh, so I have a few preliminary remarks. Uh, so you said I work for Musec, which is a company that specializes in uh, software for precisely um, continuous and mixed integer connect programming, so exactly what we're going to talk about. But I would like to stress that this is not intended to be a commercial talk. So the intention is really to uh, to get the audience closer to to uh, what we call conic programming. Um, there might be some references to Mosaic, of course, but but not exclusively, really. Um, conic programming, which, by the way, I have made the personal experience, is sometimes seen as a bit of something which is exotic or a niche in in the realm of mathematical programming, and well, maybe less so in the continuous optimization community, community but definitely in the mixed integer world, uh, I have made that experience, and maybe. Uh, one intention of uh, you find conic programming less exotic, or if you still find it exotic, then you might at least know why. Uh, but also, you might you might consider it uh, when you start your next uh, research project on an applied optimization topic, or maybe you consider it as a research area itself. Um, yeah, I call this gentle because I intend the pace to be rather slow. Uh, also because we have a lot of time. Uh, there will be no original results. Um, and also, there should be nothing too detailed when it comes to formalities or technologies. There are some slides with, which have a bit of formulas and, and some derivation. But even in that case, uh, the intention is not that you follow every step, uh, but rather I will pinpoint to two or three important points that I think will, will enable you to take home some uh, well, some mental images of, of the most important concept. Uh, so there will be nothing too detailed. I will rather point to a lot of literature, which is important. Um, yeah, so I have, uh, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, three hours in total. Um, um, So this is uh, the the way I plan on structuring this. Um, uh, can you hear me, by the way? Yeah. Yes. Uh, now it is better, but earlier it was a bit choppy. Okay. Well, maybe just if it happens again, then just uh, uh, let me know. Maybe I can try to I don't know change the setup. So if it's if it's getting too distorted, then uh, we, well, just let me know. So anyway, so this is the way I plan to structure this. So there are four parts, roughly, uh, an introduction, then a more uh, a section, a long section with uh, many examples and applications. So a, a very applied section. Uh, then there will be something slightly more theoretical on conic duality. But like I said, it's not important that you f follow all the theory there. But uh, I think there are some nice some nice images that that uh, will make you uh, remember easily some very important points. And then in the fourth and last section, uh, which will be a bit more algorithmic, I will I will uh, show the main concepts that are used for solving conic problems in practice. Okay, so I will probably uh, make short breaks in between in case there are questions. Um, okay. So let's start uh, from linear to conic programming. So there's a nice way of seeing conic programming as uh, some sort of extension of linear programming. So we implicitly assume a bit that uh, you are familiar with linear programming, uh, but even if you're not, um, it's, it's really not too technical so that nobody should get lost here. Uh, so how does that work? Um, well. A linear optimization problem in standard form, or the standard form we are going to use here, is uh, this. You have a linear function that you minimize over a set of equality constraints, linear equality constraints, and you constrain your, your uh, variable vector x to be non-negative. So a very simple form. And th this ar has arguably some, some advantages, or some, well, some, some nice points that one can notice, actually. Uh, one thing, um, 
which maybe you never think about when you just look at linear programming, but which is actually true that the, the, the structure compared to other uh, mathematical programming paradigms is very explicit and very simple. So you really ha just have uh, linear stuff and also the, the, the structure, if you think about it, so what makes linear programming difficult is just, it's not the equality constraints somehow. That's, well, in, 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 in linear algebra uh, is something which is rather easy. What makes it difficult is the non-negativity constraints on the variables. So all the structure, if you wish, is contained in this, in this last part here. And, and it's actually very, very simple to see all the structure in, in, in linear optimization. Um, and the structure is also separated somehow from the data, which are just these, uh, well, a matrix and two vectors. Uh, so structure is explicit and simple, and it's separated from the data, which is also simple. Um, one thing one usually does not think about too much when just treating linear programming is convexity. It's more important in nonlinear programming, as we see in a bit, but uh, linear programming is definitely something uh, which is which is in the realm of convex optimization. Uh, so. Uh, linear programming does not have these difficulties that you might encounter in, in nonlinear programming. Um, yeah, a very important point is, and you, whenever you take a class on linear programming, one of the first things you learn is that we have a powerful duality theory and a Farker schlemma. Um, and, and that is part of the success of LP. So that's why we have, um, we have many uh, successful, uh, robust software implementations for linear programming. Um, and, and that's arguably due to some, some advantages that, that, that this linear programming problem has. It also has a disadvantage, of course, which is the fact that it's linear only. Um, so this is sometimes also seen a, a, a bit controversial. Um, well, the world is not linear. There are some lines of thinking uh, that say, even if the world is linear, uh, maybe just looking at linear equations is enough to to approximate everything you want to do in practice. But that just this is one line of thinking. There are others. I personally also share uh, another point of view. Um, and well, given that the audience is uh, working uh, also in the field of nonlinear optimization, I, I think we can all agree on this that. Uh, well, anything there, there is reason for existence for uh, also nonlinear programming paradigms. Um, so, and that's why uh, people study nonlinear programming. Um, so, we have this 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 is a classical standard form for nonlinear programming in so-called functional form. So, we now have something which is a bit more it's a bit more uh, well not not so simple. So, we have uh, instead of everything uh, linear, we have uh, general functions that might be nonlinear, and the advantage is, of course, that this is much more general. Uh, if we think about the advantages, or maybe now the advantages of linear programming actually uh, become more apparent. Uh, what happens here now is that the structure is much less explicit. Uh, so there might be structure of the problem which is contained in F and H, uh, of course, also in G. Uh, and it's and it's and it's uh, it's way less explicit. Explicit, if you think about it from a software uh, development point of view, then the the first question you're confronted with is how let you specify these nonlinearities at all by the user. Uh, how do you compute Hessians and gradients and things you might need in a numerical solution method for that? And uh, maybe also very important is that basically in any mathematical programming paradigm, what you want to do in the end is be able to solve problems efficiently. And you usually, what you want, what you want to do, you want to exploit structure, but the less you see the structure, the more difficult it could be. So that somehow it's, it's, it's more difficult in linear programming here. Uh, smoothness, differentiability is sometimes an issue smoothness and differentiability of the involved functions. And uh, one thing that I said before, in general, when you have nonlinear programming problems, it is, it is hard in practice. It's, it, you can, in general, it's NP hard to verify whether a, conf, uh, a, a, a convex program is actually convex. 
uh, that has important implications on, on the algorithms you can use to solve such problems. And, and it's, it's, well, it's, it's, uh, so it's a real boundary between some of the linear world and the nonlinear world that a, a priori you, you don't even know whether you're convex or not. Um, so the question we are, and it's a bit of a, rhetor a rhetorical question here. The question we are pursuing here is uh, whether maybe there is some some uh, class of, of optimization problems which allow you to do something non-linear, but that preserves many of the nice properties that we see in linear programming. And the answer, or one possible answer to that question, which is the one that we give here during this talk, is of course, um, uh, uh, conic optimization or conic programming. And um, so when I was first introduced to this uh, conic framework, I was introduced to it in the same way. So that it's somehow a nice extension of linear programming issue, which it, you could call it even exaggerating a bit, linear programming for, for nonlinear problems. Um, and I was always wondering why exactly is it, so two, two things I was wondering mostly, uh, the first one of which, why exactly is it uh, cones that we treat? Uh, so why not some other shaped uh, mathematical set maybe? Why exactly cones? And then also why is it that, um, that, that it maintains so many nice properties of linear programming? And well, I don't have a co complete formal answer today, but there are some hints and one, of which uh, is the following that I would like to share with you. So I, I so this is this is I think it's nice because it gives you some intuition on these questions. So so why might conic programming be seen as this nice extension? Um, so what we're going to talk about on this slide are so-called uh, good partial orderings. Uh, so you might uh, know a partial ordering of the vector space R to the n. It's just some way of uh, stating whether two vectors, x and y, uh, are in some uh, greater or equal or, or lower or equal re relationship to, an, to, to one another. And in a book by Ben Tal and Nemirovsky that I'm going to cite more prominently in a few slides, uh, the authors define uh, a partial ordering, which is actually a so-called good partial ordering. And it's just a partial ordering that satisfies these four properties. So I specifically did not write them out mathematically because I, I don't think it's important. The important point just here is that uh, in this book, at least, um, it is claimed that a partial ordering which, is, which somehow behaves well is one that satisfies reflexivity, anti-symmetry, transitivity, and compatibility with linear operations. And now the coordinate-wise ordering, which is the ordering that underlies linear programming, is an example of such an ordering, but it's certainly not the only one. Uh, what is also true is that uh, Bantal and Nemirovsky in this book, uh, they claim that uh, a good portion of the nice properties of linear programming or of the success we have in solving linear programming problems, it somehow it comes uh, from, 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 well, from the fact that it's defined via a good partial ordering. Um, so if you, if, you, if you depart from this point of view that you would like to extend linear programming, but you would like to, to maintain nice properties, and if it's true that these nice properties come in part also from this, from, from this definition of a good partial ordering, then you should probably try to maintain uh, the definition of, via, via a good partial ordering. Um, so, and how, how do cones now come into play? Uh, yeah, this is, it looks uh, a bit technical, but it's really not important that you look at these details. Uh, it's just two facts uh, that one can prove. Um, that if you have some partial ordering of the space R to the N, so you have some way of uh, partially ordering your space, uh, it can be as abstract if you want, and then you define uh, the set of non-negative vectors with respect to this ordering, then it turns out that the set must satisfy these three properties, which you don't have to read in detail. Uh, you might realize that the first two properties together just mean that this K, which is defined in this way, it must be a convex cone. 
so let's so if if yeah it was some of the answer to one of my questions or the question that I had when I first learned about the conic framework. So what, how is it that cones come around? And that's exactly happening here. Uh, you can also show that it must be a so-called pointed cone, which basically means that it, it does not contain any lines that pass through the origin. Um, so we will see pictures of that later on. Um, so that's, that's exactly how a so-called pointed convex cone the notion of a pointed convex cone now comes into play, starting from this, these good properties of partial orderings. You can say even more, uh, you can say that conversely, if K is such a non-empty pointed convex cone, then the ordering that you define in this way, uh, so n vector x is greater or equal than y with respect to this ordering defined via K, is uh, means uh, that the difference is inside this cone. Uh, so you can think a bit about this and see that basically it's, it, well, it goes back to the, the set of non, uh, of non-negative vectors. Um, but the takeaway here is that um, if, if you wonder why exactly is it that people in conic programming study cones, um, well, that, that sometime, and uh, that somehow comes, comes exactly from these two facts. So we want to, to order our space in a, in a way that somehow behaves nicely, then there's no way around uh, looking at cones. Um, yeah, the, the partial ordering we have in LP, by the way, uh, it can be defined in exactly this way. And the cone in question there is just the non-negative or authent. Um, so that also already shows you that linear programming is also a special case of this conic framework. We will see that uh, again and again. Um, this particular cone, it has two further properties uh, that I name here. It's closed and it has a non-empty interior. Uh, and I do that just because when you read the literature, then you often see that when you do conic programming, you lead uh, closed, pointed, convex cones with non-empty interior. And this is all somehow rooted uh, here. Uh, but yeah, it's not, it's not important for this talk that you know what all these uh, attributes of a cone mean. Um, so the, the standard form of a conic programming problem that we are going uh, to look at during this talk is not this one. This is just restating uh, the linear programming problem. Um, linear programming, which we have already seen, could be stated equivalently uh, in this way. So uh, a vector being non-negative just means that it's, it must be contained in the positive or in the non-negative authent. And this is already a conic program, if you wish, because this, this set Rn plus, it can be shown to be a cone. Um, and now in, in more general conic programming, we just uh, substitute this with some cone, which can be something different. It can be more abstract. We will see many examples of that. So that's, that's the standard form of conic programming that we are going to look at during this talk. And you can easily go over to mixed integer conic programming by just re, uh, requiring that some of the variables also have to take integer values. So this is the, 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 uh, the standard form we are going to look at during the next, uh, well, maybe two hours. Uh, I already said that uh, linear programming or also mixed integer linear programming is a special case. Now I'm not saying that uh, if you're doing linear programming, or mixed integer linear programming, and you're not looking at it under the lens of conic programming, then you're doing something wrong. So I'm not saying that. That would be nonsense also, I think. But it's still nice to, to point out this fact that uh, the whole conic framework is, is, is really a generalization of, of linear programming in the sense that it, it still contains it as a real uh, special case. Another remark, uh, which is a bit more uh, practical, so typically, uh, this cone that we that we look at, so in a specific application, it will be a Cartesian product of uh, probably mm, several uh, lower dimensional cones. Um, and these these lower dimensional cones, they are often referred to as conic building blocks, or maybe bricks, or conic atoms, or actually uh, sometimes you call them primitive cones. Um, and they can be thought of as 
as encoding some very specific type of nonlinearity. So you can you can take many small cones, low dimensional cones, if you wish, that encode you some some of the nonlinearity you have in your problem, and then uh, in order to, to put that all in a big, large quantum program, you just take Cartesian products of these very small cones, uh, and that's that's why they they yeah they somehow they they build up the whole cone by just stacking on top of each other uh, many nonlinearities somehow. So um, the the next section will then uh, mostly be concerned with looking at many examples of cones that can be plugged in in this general in this in the standard form as uh, conic building blocks okay yeah to go back to these pros and cons of then the programming paradigms that we see some advantages of of conic optimization is now and this is carried over from linear programming is the separation of data and structure so the the whole structure with otherwise would be would be described somehow in nonlinear functions is now contained in this k and it's completely separate from the data which is all in the linear part of the problem um, and that can come in handy uh, in some situations when you want to analyze your problems either on paper but also computationally and we will see uh, uh, we will see an example where this is actually um, an aspect um, yeah compared to uh, general nonlinear programming uh, in conic programming you don't have issues with smoothness differentiability uh, or other things you might you might ask from your involved functions uh, and very important at least from a practical point of view is uh, this is still in the realm of convex optimization so if you require your cone to be a convex cone then there's no way around that this program will be a convex program uh, that also means, of course, um, that this is somehow separate from from non-convex programming. So actually, non-convex programming is something we will we will not actually we will not talk about. Um, but in the world of um, of of convex programming, um, this conic framework is one nice way to establish programs where you don't have the problem of not knowing a priori whether uh, whether you're actually doing convex optimization or not. Another nice, another nice thing is that we have a rich duality theory. We, there, there will be a section just on duality. And um, yeah, we usually say we have almost the duality we have in linear programming because there are some caveats. Uh, so some corner cases which you have to take care of and we will see that also in more detail. But uh, a very important point is that also in conic optimization, almost as in linear programming, we have a powerful duality theory. Uh, okay, and this is just uh, not this book that I cited before. Um, I can highly recommend this if you, if you want to know about in, well the, the, the things I told you up to now, but it also covers uh, many of the things that I'm going to tell you in the in the next sections. Um, so it's called Lectures on Modern Convex Optimization, but it almost exclusively talks about uh, conic optimization, actually. Um, okay, and that concludes the first uh, section. Um, I don't know, we could maybe see if, if there are questions so far. Take a, a one-minute break or so. I think everything clear up to now. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> then let's just continue. So we said this thing uh, about the conic building blocks. Uh, so so far it has all been uh, quite abstract. Uh, we have the standard form of conic programming. Um, and we said that the, the cone in question is actually, it can be built up of many, many smaller cones. And now we're going to look at, at uh, several examples what these cones can actually be. And um, well, I'm going to talk about um, in particular uh, five of these so-called um, uh, building blocks. And I'm going to arrange them in, in this, what I call the conic wheel. So this is just 
uh, some visualization of five of these uh, bricks. Um, I will argue a bit why exactly these five bricks are important. That will that will come at some point. Uh, but for now, uh, it's going to be just. I'm going to spend some time on talking uh, about uh, and talking in much more detail about how such uh, conic building blocks can actually look like. Um, actually, the first important building block, if you wish, um, we have already seen. It's just the LP cone. So uh, it's maybe the, yeah, if, like I said, it's not that you cannot do linear programming unless you, you treat it as conic programming. Uh, but still, if you, if, you, if you want to understand conic programming and you want to see what are, what are the, the objects that you treat inside this framework, then you cannot get around the LP cone. So it's certainly the, the, the most important cone, if you wish, the most, well, the, the cone that behaves uh, most nicely. Uh, so that's actually our first uh, building block that we have here. And now we're going to see uh, another one. Um, which are so-called quadratic cones. So if you think about, uh, maybe if you are in the world of nonlinear programming and you think what's, what's the most straightforward, the most intuitive and the most prominent extension of, of linear programming in the nonlinear direction, if you're doing nonlinear programming, it, it might be arguably um, uh, quadratic programming. Um, so, and, and the same, uh, happens here in some sense. So the, the, the most prominent cones after the non-negative auth and the LP cone are so-called quadratic cones. So what's the quadratic uh, cone or the object that we actually call the quadratic cone is the following here. It's just uh, the subset of R to the N such that the first coordinate of some vector uh, is constrained to be greater or equal than the Euclidean norm of the vector, which is made of, of the remaining coordinates. Um, so I wrote this with an n here now, but this is not meant to be the same n that we had in the general, in the standard form of conic programming. So this can really be some lower dimensional cone. This can be a subset of your variables in the whole program, and you just establish or you, you just constrain uh, them by imposing this relation on, on the subset of variables. Um, so this is uh, the quadratic cone, the most prominent cone, maybe. It comes together with a, with a, a so-called, well, a family member, if you wish. Uh, the rotated quadratic cone, it's uh, somehow, it's very similar. Uh, the relation that, that uh, defines this rotated quadratic cone is, is slightly different. It just says that um, the two times the product of the first two variables, which are the so-called root variables, it's constrained to be greater or equal than the, the squared Euclidean norm of your remaining vector. So, yeah, the, 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 the takeaway here is that uh, quadratic cones, whether non-rotated or rotated, are basically defined via Euclidean norms uh, or squared Euclidean norms. Uh, they are actually equivalent to each other, uh, in the sense that you can transform any point that lies in one cone uh, with a linear transformation to a point in the other cone without losing any information. Uh, so there's an orthogonal transformation that you can define that uh, maps you from uh, one cone to the other and back. So you might also wonder why do we study both and not just one, uh, because that might be uh, less work or so. Uh, that is true in some sense, but also uh, from the more practical point of view, we will see that there are many modeling applications where, where the rotated, uh, rotated quadratic cone is somehow more direct. So that's why usually um, when you do conic optimization, you see both of these cones, um, although they are equivalent uh, in theory. Um, yeah, here are some, some pictures of these two cones uh, in dimension three. Um, so in general, they can be more dimensional, but uh, for the sake of being able to make a picture, we have them in dimension three. On the left, we have the quadratic cone itself. Um, now you see why exactly this is called the rotated quadratic cone. It's just rotated by 90 degrees in the x1, x2 plane. Um, 
you might have seen these pictures before. The quadratic cone sometimes is called also the Lorentz cone or the second order cone or more informally the ice cream cone. Um, but this is exactly the same thing. So that's the object we are talking about. Um, and we are now going to see uh, some use case for this. So I said, uh, well, that's the conic framework. Now we have an example of what we can plug in as one of these conic building blocks. And now we're going to, uh, we're going to see an example where we can actually apply that or what we can use it for. Uh, and, and a nice example uh, in, my, in my view is uh, least squares regression. Um, so you, you have probably seen this in one form or the other. We have a, a vector of observations y and a matrix of observed features x. And now we want to estimate some parameters such that if we combine our observations with these uh, weights, then we will get a good, good approximation of our observations y. So what you do basically is you, you minimize the loss measured in a Euclidean norm. So this is uh, the minimization of a Euclidean norm, which is a um, convex optimization. Um, and it's, it's almost hand-waving here how this is an application for, for the quadratic cone. So we have seen that quadratic cones are basically defined via Euclidean norms or squared Euclidean norms. So if you see this where you basically have the, the only structure that you see is a Euclidean norm, then it's, it's, it's almost uh, hand-waving how this uh, could be cast in the conic framework. And uh, this is what we're going to do now. So in, in general, um, when you want to formulate optimization problems or convex optimization problems in the conic framework, uh, it is true that in some cases you have to perform a small amount of reformulation. And we will see several examples of that uh, in order to give you a flavor what, what such reform, uh, reformulation might mean, uh, whether it's, it's, it's simple or maybe more involved. And the first example is this. Um, so if you, if you, I mean, if you look at uh, this problem, it's, it's convex optimization, but it's, it's uh, still in some form that, uh, well, maybe you, you don't really know uh, to, in which, in which uh, standard form you can put that, but you can put this in the standard form of conic optimization. Uh, this happens in the following way. The first trick that you apply is uh, just that, um, well, you do, you do that frequently also in mixed integer nonlinear pro linear programming, for example. So minimizing some quantity is the same as minimizing an auxiliary variable that you constrain to be bounded by below by this quantity that you actually want to minimize. So, so this should be uh, straightforward. And now in order to put this in the conic framework, one thing you can do is you introduce yet another auxiliary variable, uh, which you constrain to be equal to this thing of which you want to minimize the Euclidean norm. And then this S, or if, if you define S in this way, then T and S is just constrained to lie in the uh, quadratic cone. So this is, this is uh, precisely a conic program in the standard form we, ha we have looked at before. And, and, and we, we see that, well, we, we got there with a small amount of reformulation. Um, and, and this is one feature that we will see in, in some more examples, so that's true. Uh, but still, we have seen our first example of a conic program. Um, just a note on the notation, so on the last step, uh, I basically I, I I took out this y minus x w out of out of the well the second part of the vector which is constrained to lie in the cone, uh, but this is just some notational thing. So this would be uh, this would be required to be done if you really want to put it in the standard form. But since we can use uh, linear equations as we please, basically, in order to make notation more compact, we will often write also things like this. So maybe this is more intuitive, maybe not. Uh, but we will see many examples of where we write just uh, such things here. But uh, the transferal of something like this to the standard form of conic programming is, is not hard because, because you can always uh, introduce auxiliary variables, uh, linear equations, um, as you please.
but yeah, for writing, this may be a bit more uh, convenient. Okay, so it's the first use case of uh, a conic program. Okay, there is much more you can do actually with quadratic modeling. So one theme of this talk will also be to say that um, we have this framework of, of conic programs and there's actually, there are many, many, many things, arguably, uh, that can be cast in this framework. So that's why we're going to see many examples also. Uh, here are some more of, uh, here are some more examples that can be cast uh, in the conic framework with, with uh, quadratic cones. Um, so you sometimes see uh, what people call second order inequalities. That's just straightforwardly uh, formulation, including the quadratic cone. Um, so that's what I said before. If you introduce uh, auxiliary variables, uh, then this is maybe more direct. But this is this is really a straightforward uh, formulation uh, using the notation of a quadratic cone. So it's exactly the same thing. <clears throat> you can also model squared Euclidean norms. Um, this is basically a direct, uh, almost the, the definition of a rotated quadratic cone. So if you want to model this, maybe you remember that the rotated quadratic cone uh, meant something like uh, two times um, S times T is greater or equal than the squared Euclidean norm. Now, if you fix this S to one half, it multiplies with the two to one, and then you're left with precisely this. Yeah, so this is almost plugging in just the definition. It also uh, highlights, though, uh, a, a trick that is that is, that is uh, routinely done when you when you perform conic formulations of convex optimization problems. You sometimes you sometimes have some variables that you don't actually need, but on paper this is not a problem because you can just uh, fix them in the linear part of the of your problem. So fixing the second root variable to one half. It's just a linear equation, if you wish. So this is routinely done, and this is one easy example where this happens. Fixing a variable that is in a cone because you don't actually need it for your problem, but but it is still it is contained in the objects uh, which we use to model them, which are the cones. Uh, another important point: a convex quadratic inequality. So if you do quadratic programming or mixed integer quadratic programming, you might have seen this. Uh, anything which is quadratic programming, uh, or in particular convex uh, quadratic programming, so that means that this matrix Q that is involved here in this uh, in this uh, quadratic constraint is positive semi-definite. Whenever you have such a thing, uh, you have a guarantee that if you want, you can reformulate it to a, a conic program. So, well, you know from theory that if Q is uh, positive semi-definite, uh, you can decompose it into into the product of some matrix F with its transpose. So there might be there might be various choices for for such a factorization. Um, one example is a Cholesky factorization, uh, for example. But so there are in 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 theory, but also in practice, there are, there are many ways to find uh, such a factorization. And then I don't do the math here, but uh, you just have to trust me on this. That then, if if I if I uh, plug this into the, the definition of a, rot a rotated quadratic cone, um, then if f is such that its product with its transpose gives you q, then you will recover exactly this uh, convex quadratic inequality. So as a con as a consequence, in case you have never seen this before, any convex mixed integer, a quadratically constrained quadratic program does have a reformulation which fits into uh, the conic framework. So it will then be a so-called, what people sometimes call mixed integer second order cone program, but you can also call it a mixed integer conic quadratic program, which is exactly the same thing. Um, okay. Uh, yes, some more quadratic modeling. So one thing uh, I would like to highlight here is, or maybe if we go back uh, to these pictures, maybe if you if you remember from maybe even from high school in geometry, uh, the way in which uh, parabolas and circles, ellipses and hyperbolas are introduced somehow, um, or they are sometimes introduced 
as the intersections of hyperplanes with this uh, precisely this cone. Uh, and if you think about it, that's exactly what happens in the conic framework. So you have a bunch of linear equations, which uh, in geometry, well, or, well if, you, if you visualize them in R to the N, they are just uh, hyperplanes. So you basically intersect a cone with a bunch of hyperplanes. And if you imagine that happening here in the picture, so you slice this cone uh, in two parts with some hyperplane, then the part on the boundary will precisely be, depending on how you slice it, maybe a circle, maybe an ellipsis, uh, uh, hyperbola. And that is, well, that is somehow an intuitive explanation of how you can uh, model square roots, uh, convex hyperbolic functions, some convex rational powers, parabolas, and so forth. Um, with these uh, quadratic cones. Um, a further example that I would like to go through a bit more in detail is the following. So again, it's not important for the rest of the talk that you that you uh, perform these steps now. Uh, why I do this is because I again want to highlight that um, there there is a lot that you can that you can model with the cones. So the quadratic cone in this case. Uh, but it's also true that it sometimes uh, requires <clears throat> re requires a bit amount of work. Um, so yes, uh, how can you model this equation? T is greater or equal than x to the two uh, th uh, three halves. Um, what you can impose is actually uh, two quadratic constraints using the rotated quadratic cone. So if I have S T X and uh, the second vector in the rotated uh, rotated quadratic cone. By definition, this just means these two things. This is nothing more than just writing out the definition of uh, what it means that a vector is in the rotated quadratic cone. And now if you multiply the two left-hand sides and the two right-hand sides, then the inequality is preserved and you get this which you can then uh, simplify a bit, and you get what you initially wanted to model. So um, this is uh, one, one, one of these examples um, that I think is somehow intuitive for, for, um, for making clear this, uh, this, this feature of the conic framework, that it's very versatile. You can model many, many things. Uh, but at the same time, it is true that sometimes is it's not a no-brainer to do that. So I mean, this is not complicated mathematics, uh, but still, it, it it somehow it highlights um, that you sometimes have to do a bit of work in order to get there. So you can do a lot of stuff, um, but you have to sit down and do it actually. Okay. So that was our first uh, conic building block, the quadratic cone. Um, we have argued that there are many things you can model. Um, we are now seeing a second building block. And this is, well, this is the, the so-called positive semi-definite cone. Uh, now you can, you cannot probably not do convex optimization without ever thinking about uh, the positive semi-definite cone. And also you cannot introduce uh, conic programming without the positive semi-definite cone. What is sometimes a bit uh, scary, I think, or at least, uh, well, that was for me personally. So when, when I was first introduced to the conic framework, uh, which was already new because there was this new concept of a cone and so on. And then in addition to that, um, uh, you can, um, you can, well, you, there were, uh, well, there are vector variables, which is what I'm used to personally. But then if you, if you introduce the semi-definite cone and you do it in the matrix space, then you suddenly also have matrix variables, which is maybe an additional mental burden in order to grasp uh, this new framework. Uh, so that's why what I like to highlight or to pinpoint at least is that you can introduce the semi-definite cone also in the vector space, which is what, what, well, what, what, uh, what I personally like. Although uh, in many cases, it's not convenient notationally, but if you if you if you come from from well from the derivation that we did here, um, I think it it it's somehow uh, a more more nicer way than introducing it only via matrix variables. So 
The semidefinite cone in vector space is just uh, the set which is defined in this way. The condition that is imposed here, uh, this is the usual usual condition uh, for semidefiniteness that you probably know uh, from from a convex analysis class or from linear, al uh, linear algebra. Um, so this is this is nothing else, but still you can define it in vector space, uh, and you can you, well you can basically you can map back and forth between the vector and the metric space using using these transformations. Um, we can also write down the definition of the positive semidefinite cone in matrix space precisely, which is the straightforward way uh, well most people are are used to. Uh, but like I said, so here you have to think about variables that are matrices. And if you don't like that way of thinking, then just think about it as a vector cone. Uh, and But like I said, it's it's precisely the same thing because you can map back and forth between these two cones. If you use these mappings, for example, which have some scaling factors that you might see, square root of two and one over square root of two, uh, if you if you uh, perform these mappings in these ways, uh, then you have the nice property that, for example, Euclid, uh, Euclidean norms are preserved uh, in these two spaces. Um, okay, so that's the PSD cone. It's the second building block. Um, also here, I would like to give a, an, an example of a use case which is a nice topic from, from convex optimization. Um, so again, here, the, the purpose is to see that uh, there are many examples which arise in, in what we usually call convex optimization that can be somehow cast into this conic framework. Uh, yeah, now with matrix variables, it's, it's a bit more difficult to get your head around sometimes, but still, this is a nice example. Uh, so correlation matrices. Um, so what's the correlation matrix? Uh, it's a positive semidefinite matrix that has all ones on its diagonal. Uh, so where does it pop up? Well, in statistics, for example, uh, when you have when you measure different quantities, for example, body height and body weight, and you want to know how they how they correlate to each other, you build up the correlation matrix, uh, probably based on observations that you made in in a sample that you took. And now, on paper, the correlation matrix will always be positive semidefinite and have all ones on its diagonal. All ones on this on the diagonal comes from the fact that, uh, well, any quantity correlated with itself is is uh, perfectly correlated, so giving you a one. Um, but also, it will always be a positive semidefinite matrix itself. Now, in practice, it can happen. That you maybe you have a, a database, a database with matter measurements um, that in theory would give rise to a correlation matrix, but your data might be imperfect. It might be there might be missing data or flawed data, leading to the fact that when you correlate, uh, when you compute the correlation matrix of your data, it will not be positive semidefinite. So it might have, uh, even though in absolute value very small, but it might have negative eigenvalues which is what you then cannot use somehow in your computational approach. And that's why you would like to somehow find a real a correlation matrix that is very close to your observed matrix A. And this is why you want to project this matrix that you observed onto the space of correlation matrices. So this is uh, the optimization problem of uh, finding a nearest correlation matrix. So you want to, you want to minimize the distance somehow of your observed matrix from from the matrix uh, from the set of matrices that you actually are interested in, usually you would do this in the Frobenius norm, which is somehow the the uh, matrix equivalent of the Euclidean norm. And now a conic formulation in vector space of this of this problem uh, is given here. So again, you have this trick that you have uh, the additional variable t, which is somehow greater to uh, this quantity that you actually want to minimize. And if you formulate this in vector space, then the Frobenius norm becomes a Euclidean norm. And that's how we get to a, uh, to a quadratic cone constraint here. Um, then we have another conic constraint, which, which is what we need, uh, namely that uh, this variable, 
or the, the matrix variable x or the vector variable small x is uh, semi-definite, positive semi-definite. And then imposing that the diagonal is one, that, that's just, uh, you just have to figure out, so if you write it in the vector space, you just have to figure out the right entries in your vector that correspond to the diagonal of the matrix, basically. Uh, basically. But you impose them to be all one, which is just uh, a bunch of linear equations. So this is uh, this is a um, an example of uh, of a um, semi-definite program or use case for the semi-definite cone. And another feature of the conic framework I would like to highlight here is so this is also uh, the first example in which we have um, cones from different families somehow in the same program. Uh, so if you think back to the conic framework, um, the, the, the whole cone, the large cone, was a, a, the Cartesian product of many small cones. And these small cones, they don't necessarily have to be uh, either all quadratic or all semi-definite. You can also have mixtures. And, and this is an example of it. Uh, what you cannot have in the conic framework is that a single variable, uh, say, I don't know, xj, is... Uh, in the intersection of two different cones, I mean, you cannot write that down directly, but you can always model that by just introducing copies of these variables. You can model all that with um, then uh, auxiliary variables and linear equations, so that's not a problem. Um, okay, so uh, STP. This is a uh, first example of an STP. Um, there are more interesting, or uh, in my view, interesting applications of semi-definite modeling. Uh, you might have applications where you have real, uh, so matrix variables, so you might have some engineering application or other applications where you have a, a matrix, which is a variable, so you have degrees of freedom on your, on your, on your matrix. You, you may shape it in some sense. And something you might want to do sometimes is somehow, uh, well, determine your matrix, but uh, keep under control somehow its eigenvalues, maybe the largest eigenvalue, the smallest eigenvalue, the range of eigenvalues with a similar, um, with a similar trick, you can, for example, you can also control uh, condition numbers of matrices. And this is something that you can, well, if, if, if your objective is some, something that is convex, then you can model that with, um, with semi-definite modeling, so that, that can lead to STPs. Um, one prominent thing I, I, I would like to mention, um, um, where, where STPs are uh, pop up sometimes, are uh, STP relaxations that can play a role in quadratic programming and combinatorial optimization problems. Uh, so you may have seen this for the max cut problem maybe, or a quadratic assignment problem, or also just in quadratic uh, programming, people have analyzed STP relaxations. And this comes from the fact that if you have a, a vector variable or a vector of, of real variables, but you study their products and you arrange all these products in a, in a matrix, capital X, then you would impose this equation. So this precisely means that uh, X contains all the products between variables X, Y, X, J. And now this is a non-convex constraint, so it's somehow nasty. But if you relax it, uh, what you get is something which is precisely a semi-definite constraint. So that's how uh, STP pops up in these relaxation techniques for, for uh, quadratic programming. And um, if, if you still find it abstract somehow, um, how STP can pop up in practice, there's this uh, nice paper uh, by Galib, Fetch, and Ulbrich, uh, where they actually, they introduce some, uh, an algorithmic framework for mixed integer STPs, but there are also, there's this nice example of uh, so-called trust topology design where, where, where this explains how a mixed integer, or well, first of all, STPs then combined with mixed integer variables, but STPs at all, how that can pop up in real, real engineering applications. Um, so there's, there's certainly also a lot of uh, applications for STPs. 
Okay, so uh, now let's go back for some minute to uh, to this to the conic wheel. Um, so we have basically added we had uh, we have added two conic building blocks uh, to this wheel. So now we have three cones: LP cones, quadratic cones, and STP cones. And now an important fact, which is I'm not going to go through it formally. Um, but what, what is important or what will be important later on also is that these three cones, uh, they are so-called symmetric cones. So there are some properties that you can define for cones, uh, for example, homogeneity and self-duality, which again, explicitly, I did not write down the definitions uh, formally because I don't think it's important for this talk. We will see self-duality at some point, but, but at this point, it's not important. Uh, what's important to remember is that uh, the three cones we have seen so far, they're so-called symmetric cones, uh, which is something which, again, we will see later, is, is something which is somehow desirable. Uh, we will now introduce two more cones, and, and they will be non-symmetric cones. And this, in practice, um, this really has some implications that we will talk about later. Um, so the, the, the takeaway here is that uh, some of all these cones that we look at, they are symmetric, and they are they are very nice um, mathematically. Uh, Non-symmetric cones can also be nice, but maybe a bit less so. So if if you if you if you could choose, uh, you would somehow prefer symmetric cones over non-symmetric cones. The problem is there are not so so many symmetric cones. Um, so I, I I don't have the exact formal result here, but uh, you can show somehow that, uh, apart from maybe um, bijective transformations, there are I think maybe a number of of five or six classes of um, of symmetric cones, three of which we have seen here. So there are not so many of these nice cones, and actually the only ones that are considered practically relevant are these three. So there's, for example, one of these further cones is maybe some uh, twenty-seven dimensional. Uh, matrix cone defined over Hermitian matrices or, or something exotic like that, uh, which means that if you do practical optimization, uh, then in terms of symmetric cones, these three are basically the only thing you can encounter. Um, okay. So um, we have two more building blocks to look at, and then our, our wheel will be complete somehow. Um, so that means we, we're going to see some more uh, applications. Uh, the next one's based on the so-called exponential cone. So in words, the exponential cone is the closure of the epigraph of the perspective of the exponential function. It sounds complicated. Um, it somehow it means this. Uh, so it's it's maybe uh, a bit more complicated than a quadratic cone because you have to take the closure. Um, another difference is that we only define it in three dimensions. Yes, so the uh, quadratic cones were defined in a general dimension, uh, n, m. The exponential cone is only seen in three dimensions. If you don't like uh, this closure notation, um, you can show that it is more explicitly uh, uh, you can you can write it as this. So the second part is precisely um, the part that comes from taking the closure in the definition above. And now uh, this to uh, this cone turns out to be non-symmetric. So I'm not going to show that, also because I didn't show formally what that means. But uh, so uh, one thing for you to remember if you're interested in in well. In the behavior and in the properties of these different cones and so on, this is a non-symmetric cone. It's maybe the most prominent one, but it's it's a non-symmetric cone. So it divides it somehow from the from this uh, from the cones that we had seen earlier. Um, this is a picture of it. So when you write down the definition, it, it's it's of course more abstract, but if you actually try to to draw a picture, then something like this comes out. Uh, so um, well, it's it's truncated here, of course, but uh, you can imagine that this is again it's it's uh, 
well, it's a cone. It's not so super symmetric, uh, also not in the picture, uh, but still it's a cone. This piece which is spanned here in the X1, X3 plane is precisely what you get from going over to the closure and the rest is uh, when, well, when the X2 is positive. Um, and again here you can imagine, for example, that if you intersect this, uh, the, the boundary of this cone with a, say, hyperplane, which is, which is parallel to the X1, X3 uh, plane, then you get something which uh, models exponential growth. So at this part, this cone is somehow, it's, it's going rapidly up. And if you intersect that with a, a vertical plane, uh, then you get then you get exactly what an exponential function would look like. So that's that's somehow how you get from here to modeling easy exponentials, and in the same way logarithms. Um, and now we have um, now we have um, an example of of what a use case of this uh, exponential cone uh, could be. So what what uh, can you use it for? And again, uh, here the the driving theme somehow is to show that um, again there's there's a versatility for for this cone there are things you can model with it things of interest uh, but also uh, you have you have to to uh, to see how to do that so you have to perform some 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 reformulations in order to get there so this is one example that we're going to go through uh, another example that we're going to go through in a bit more detail um, so Geometric programming, um, you might be familiar with it, or if not, that's also not a problem. Um, geometric programming is basically the optimization over so-called polynomials. Uh, polynomials are almost like uh, polynomials. Uh, the difference is that uh, the exponents in a polynomial, like here, they can also be fractional values, uh, whereas in a polynomial that uh, they have to be integers, but at the same time, all the coefficients of such a polynomial have to be positive. So you cannot have, uh, I don't know, a, a minus one in front of here. That's why they're called polynomials. So that's a that's a, um, a simple uh, geometric program. Uh, note also the uh, strict positivity on the involved variables. And now, if we want to reformulate that in the conic framework. Um, we we need another trick first, um, and I, again I don't expect you to to do that uh, on paper now, and it's not important uh, to get the main message of this slide. Um, uh, uh, we just state that um, basically the the fact that this convex equation, which is is sum of exponentials constrained to be lower or equal than one. That can always be modeled by introducing an auxiliary variable for each of these terms in the sum, imposing an exponential cone constraint on it, and then we have some additional uh, linear constraint. Um, so, yeah, like I said, it's not important that you do this now, but uh, the, the 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 takeaway is uh, you can you can model this object, um, and this is how you can do it. Um, and then the next trick in order to apply that to a geometric program is to substitute these variables x, y, z with uh, e to the p, e to the q, e to the r. Now p, q, and r are basically the variables. And that is completely coherent because you will have uh, x's, y's, and z's which are completely positive even if you have completely free variables p, q, r. And then uh, if you if you if you plug the substitutions in and do some transformations uh, that are that are very basic, then you get to a point where you can apply uh, this modeling trick, and you get a bunch of exponential constraints and some auxiliary linear constraints, linear uh, auxiliary variables. So this is again something you can do. So uh, again, to sum up. Um, there, 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 there are, are again uh, many, many applications for for exponential cone modeling, but you might to do uh, you might have to do some work in order to get there. Uh, here are more examples. Uh, so, as you can model simple exponentials, as we have somehow seen already, it's equally simple to model simple logarithms. 
so basically you just switch the position of or the roles of x and t um, you can model things that arise in entropy optimization relative entropy optimization um, here's one more example where we model the so-called soft plus function which pops up in logistic regression for example so again there are many applications for this exponential cone modeling um, here again there is there is some auxiliary variables that you have to introduce uh, but if you're willing to do so then you can model many many uh, things arising in convex optimization okay uh, the last building block we're going to introduce uh, more in detail now it's the so-called uh, power cone now the the power cone is actually it's a family of cones because it's parametrized in some with the in in, in an in an alpha uh, the exponent alpha which is has to be between zero and one and fixing one alpha uh, the equation that describes um, the power cone is uh, the following so it, it's a, it's somehow similar to a rotated uh, quadratic cone just that you have some some freedom in uh, in the power here so it's not necessarily uh, a square um, you can have arbitrary exponents and then on the right hand side again you have a Euclidean norm um, sometimes if you see the power cone you all only see it introduced in three dimensions as well um, that can be done because if uh, well if you introduce an auxiliary variable z again an auxiliary variable and you also have the quadratic cone at disposal then you can model the n-dimensional power cone with the three-dimensional power cone so uh, you sometimes see that um, but this that's that's more uh, detail and now what's important here the the power cone it's the second example of a non-symmetric cone so uh so if you think of the of these five cones that we have introduced now lp quadratic stp uh exponential and power then the first three are symmetric cones and power and exponential cone are non-symmetric um here are pictures of a power cone for two values of alpha. So you see again, it, it somehow it looks similar like a rotated quadratic cone. Just the more you, you get the alpha away from one half, uh, the more the cone gets skewed uh, somehow. Okay, applications. Um, well, you can model simple powers. Um, if you want to model, for example, t lower or equal than x to the p, where the p is uh, between 0 and 1. This is a convex inequality. And you can just model that by, again, fixing one of the root variables in the power cone to 1. And then you get a straightforward uh, power cone application. Um, when your p is larger than 1, uh, then the convex, in, uh, equal, uh, convex constraint is given somehow by changing the rules of x and uh, t. Now the p becomes uh, 1 over the p in, uh, in the parameter of the power cone. Um, but the rest is similar. So that's how you can model simple powers. Um, an example here actually is uh, this, this constraint that we had seen before. So we had modeled that some slides ago with two uh, quadratic cones. And now we can see that with the power cone, actually, this can be modeled much more directly. Um, and this is also to show this 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 feature in the in the in the conic uh, programming framework that allowing for for more cones may make your modeling easier. So we have seen that uh, in order to model that with the uh, rotated quadratic cone, there was some work that we had to do, and now that we have a new cone, uh, we can model it much more directly. So this is somehow this feature uh, that. The more cones you have, uh, the more direct modeling you can do, maybe. Uh, but we will see also that uh, it's not that it's so uh, going over to to arbitrarily many different cones might also not be uh, not be the method of choice. But there's somehow this trade-off. So more cones make uh, make your modeling more versatile. Uh, 
but but it will it might also be harder to handle many cones. But we will we will get to that. Uh, anyway, uh, for now, uh, other applications of the power cone are uh, arise when you when you have, for example, p norms. So not just Euclidean norms, but more general p norms included included in your optimization problems. You can model the geometric mean, for example, and there are other applications. Um, so now we, we have completed uh, this, um, this conic wheel. And now, um, well, it's, it's made up of five, uh, made up of uh, exactly five cones. And you might wonder why exactly is it these five cones that we look at? And there, there is some, some, some reason to believe that these are somehow uh, reasonable cones to look at. Um, there's no, no formal, really formal results on that, but what we have uh, are these uh, somehow folkloristic uh, sayings, especially in the continuous optimization community. So it's, it's, it's more of a belief that has been there for, for many years that says that anything that arises in convex optimization in practice is somehow representable if you're willing to perform some reformulation with these five cones. So that's why we focus, focused so far precisely on these five cones. And again, it's not a formal theorem, uh, but it's, 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 it's what has been in the heads of the people in the continuous optimization community uh, for years that, that these five objects are somehow, they, they are more or less everything you need if you want to model uh, anything that comes up in convex optimization. If it's not everything, then it's maybe 90%, 95, 99. So it's, it's not, like I said, there's no formal results on that. But it's, it's, uh, it's somehow a belief that almost anything that is convex has some reformulation using these five cones that we have seen, three of which are symmetric cones and two are non-symmetric cones. There's uh, some more evidence of this folkloristic saying also in the mixed integer world. So if you're familiar with these uh, mixed integer nonlinear programming libraries, for example, uh, not so many years ago, uh, Miles Lubin and, and co-authors of his, they showed that all instances from this library that are convex can actually be reformulated um, with these five cones. Actually, you only need uh, four of these cones. The one that you don't need is actually the uh, STP cone which is maybe, it's a bit intuitive if you think about the fact that the instances in the mixed integer nonlinear programming library um, are, are, well, they are usually defined uh, with uh, on functional form. So in, in a general uh, nonlinear uh, programming form. Um, and the STP cone is not really something that, that, that is deducible from, uh, from, from uh, functional form, um, but the other four cones are. So, so there's more evidence also in the mixed integer world that these five cones are very versatile for modeling. And, and now that's, that's a, it's a quite fundamental slide actually, because it tells you that if you have um, any application um, of which you know that it's a convex optimization application and you want to choose a software for solving it, or maybe you want to design some software for it, uh, then, then among the methods from which you can choose is likely to be also a uh, well a, 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 co a conic programming paradigm which allows for for these five cones. So it's quite fundamental. Or if you want to look at it from a different side, from from a software development point of view, maybe if you are a software vendor, then if you design a software that can handle these five cones. Uh, then you already know that this will cover many, many applications in practice. Um, maybe 99% of what you will encounter. So it's a quite fundamental slide in that regard. Um, okay, so let's see. Yeah, another thing that is somehow, which, which I want to get uh, back now, is this thing about verifying convexity. So. Uh, this somehow points at at at, uh, at the phenomenon under which this framework somehow is different from from uh, nonlinear programming. 
So a question that comes up, especially in practice, uh, many often is that you have some some nonlinear constraint. And really, you you don't know a priori whether it's convex or not. So um, yeah, maybe this is an example. So it's, it's somehow a complicated looking uh, function uh, composed of many expressions, one inside the other. And so, is it in the end, is it a uh, is it a convex constraint? So can I use it with convex optimization methods, or can I not? Do I have to resort to non-convex optimization methods? Uh, which are which are in, will increase the computational burden. Um, it's not so trivial. Uh, for example, I took this one from the from the CVX forum. Um, what happens there? So, uh, well, CVX is is a um, is a, um, a a software for convex modeling, basically. And what comes up there? Uh, very often is is this question. So I have this I have this somehow strange looking function. I don't know if it's convex. Uh, is it or is it not? How can I prove it? And that's that's a very hard thing to do in practice. And one solution to this problem that was proposed uh, a bit more formally is the so-called disciplined convex uh, programming paradigm by Grant Boyd and Yi. And basically, disciplined convex programming. Is, is basically it describes a set of rules that you have to obey when uh, composing different operators to an initially convex uh, expression. So say you have a convex exp expression, I don't know, um, you have your x, for example, and then now you, you uh, apply some operators to it in order to get to your final expression that you want to model. And if you obey the disciplined convex programming rules, in all of these uh, transformation steps, then you will be sure that your final expression is convex. So that's somehow uh, the solution to this problem. Um, it's, by the way, also it's the the, the paradigm that is at the basis of uh, CVX. So and now, if we get back to this uh, to this conic wheel with the five cones, uh, and this is this is a bit more mosaic specific. Uh, so we have we have coined this expression of extremely disciplined convex programming. So if you if you uh, constrain yourself to model with only the five cones we have seen, then we would call that an extremely disciplined convex programming. So it's in some sense it's more strict than disciplined convex programming. But what you are revo uh, rewarded with is that you have structural convexity. So there's no way around that. Uh, you get something which is uh, solvable with, with convex optimization methods. And um, well, like I said, it's a bit the, the standpoint that, that Mosek has taken. Um, it's This is just a line of thinking. There might be others. Uh, what is a bit behind this extremely disciplined convex programming uh, principle is the belief that if you restrict yourself to to somehow a limited structure, so to only five cones, uh, then if you know how to handle these cones uh, efficiently um, in software, um, then, then you have something very powerful. And restricting to a limited set of cones might, might enable you to do, to do things better somehow. So uh, if, you, if you don't have to worry about too much different structures, then you can focus more on the structure you have and be more efficient there. So that's somehow um, the idea also behind this extremely disciplined convex programming paradigm, but it's not. So this is just uh, this is just one take on this on the on uh, the convex programming world, if you wish. Um, okay, so uh, maybe this is a good point to take a break. Um, I will say. Let me recap shortly where we were. Uh, basically, we, we arrived at this at this uh, thing which we called extremely disciplined convex programming, which means using the cones from this uh, wheel composed of five building blocks. And then we argued um, <clears throat> a bit why why that is. Uh, well, we we said what what specifically. Um, Mosex perspective is on all that, but uh, but I stress it's not the only perspective one could have. So it's just uh, our our take on the whole game, 
and there might be there might be other other lines of thinking that one might want to adopt and uh, we'll see that um, so we, we build up all this tension now with these five cones um, um, and saying that this is somehow this is important to focus on or can be important. But the first question that you might ask then is, of course, um, so are there more cones uh, which might be interesting to look at? And the answer is, is uh, certainly yes, uh, especially with regard to this generality. So you might wonder, um, when I start with the convex function, then maybe I, if I want to put that in the conic framework with the five cones, then maybe I have to perform reformulation, uh, which might be which might be a hassle if it's a very complicated convex function. Uh, so, isn't there uh, something which is more direct? And the answer is yes, indeed. So it's actually a trivial answer. This is something maybe you have heard that. Uh, Actually, well, it tells you a bit about the generality of conic programming, um, but it also makes you wonder about the five cones, maybe. So we have this fact that uh, for for any convex function, uh, g of x, if you have the constraint uh, y is greater or equal than g of x, for example, this can be trivially put into conic form by just defining, uh, well, this is basically, well, you can just, uh, look at the closure of the epigraph of the perspective of this function, you can, which is which is this set, and you can show uh, you can show it's a it's a cone again. So you could just say, so what if I define this cone, um, and then I I can directly put my convex function into the conic framework. So that is true uh, to some extent, but what is what is what is not necessarily clear, and that's why at Mosic, for example, we adopted the point of view that. Uh, at least as of today, we, we would like to use this to reformulate it into the five cones we know. Uh, that's because it's not necessarily clear, at least at least uh, in, in the Mosaic line of thinking, that, that uh, every cone K that you maybe define in this way is computationally tractable, or at least at the, so at the very least, for knowing how to handle it computationally, you have to you have to do some work, and then. Uh, you have no guarantee that it's that it's particularly nice computationally, at least uh, that's what we think. Um, but so in theory, you can do this. So are there more cones? Yes, there are more cones. Um, in terms of this generality, we've argued that the five cones are quite general, but are they really 100% general or do we maybe need more cones? Um, and so now, I, I, well, I have the screenshot of this uh, blog post here. I don't expect you to read all of it. I will, I will point to uh, maybe three, uh, three points. So I will guide you a bit through this. This is an excerpt, actually, of a blog post uh, which is on the on the Mosec blog. So if you want to read it in more detail, you can you can do that by just going to the uh, Mosec website to the blog, and then this is this is from from June two thousand nineteen. Um, a bit of a bit of context uh, here. So uh, in in Mosec we introduced these these two non-symmetric cones, the exponential and the power cone, around two years ago. And uh, uh, usually then, well, we we advertised a bit this this generality in the same way I did it before. Um, so the folkloristic saying that you can uh, you can basically represent anything that is convex in practice you can represent using these five cones and and we used to post this uh, this thing a bit as a challenge to users so we said uh, things like if you if you come up with a convex function that you can show is not representable using the five cones then then we would send them some free merchandise for example and by now so two years later there there are actually some examples um, where this is not so clear how to re get a reformulation with the five cones. Uh, so the example in this blog post is this: is actually the reciprocal of a logarithmic mean temperature difference. So you can show that this this uh, the epigraph of this function here this is actually a convex thing. Um, so convexity is not a problem, but how do you represent it with the five cones? Um, you can do some reformulation. You make it a bit easier. You get something which you can model with the power cone here. Uh, you have some linear relationship, but then there's still some term which has an exponential, yes. But it's not clear how to reformulate this directly with the exponential cone. 
Um, so this is this is uh, not not a counter example in the sense that you have a convex constraint for which we have a mathematical proof that you cannot reformulate it with the five cones, but also no nobody knows how to do it. So maybe there is a way, maybe there's not. It seems to be difficult. Um, and then, well, what you could do is, of course, uh, well, you could just define an, a new cone uh, if you want to do that. Um, but then also in this blog post, then uh, it is a bit argued that not necessarily you know that uh, you know how to how to how to uh, make it tractable computationally. So um, it might be that we do need more cones. Um, it's very general, the extremely disciplined convex programming framework, but uh, maybe it's not 100 percent of the of the practical convex optimization world maybe it is maybe it's not like i said it's not it's not a counter example with the proof but also it there seem to be few cases where it's quite difficult to get such a reformulation so there's no formal theory on, on on these things um also what is another point is that we have so in some of the uh, application slides uh, we explicitly performed this reformulation and one thing that happens there often is, and you saw that, is that you introduce uh, auxiliary variables and some uh, linear constraints. So that increases the dimension of your problem. That's not always a problem also because especially what you introduce into the matrix A is usually very sparse. So it does not necessarily harm you that much, but still you somehow, you make your problems bigger. So a point or a, a philosophy which is somehow not not too congruent with the with the one that Mosek adopted, which forces you to use only five cones. Another philosophy uh, could be um, to to allow for more and more cones in order to not have to perform uh, reformulations. And I, I have no evidence that this is that this is a wrong philosophy. Um, in Mosek, we have a lot of or we well we 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 have evidence that at least the way we do it seems to work well for what we want to do so far, but we, we don't say that, that uh, other ways of, of attacking this, this uh, convex or conic programming uh, um, field. So we're not saying there can't be other ways to, to, to approach that. Um, a very recent paper, um, goes into that direction um, from uh, Koei Kapelovich and Vielma. Um, they they uh, basically uh, wrote this, uh, or they, yes, it's, it's an open source software implementation called Hypatia, it's written in Julia, and it's intended to be a, a framework for generic conic uh, programming. So what they do is they, they actually allow the user to specify in some way, which we will see later, uh, to specify completely generic cones. So the user can specify a cone that the, the, the software maybe had never seen before. And in theory, it, it can work to optimize over these cones. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's, that's one part of this uh, more other philosophy, if you wish. Um, they also uh, give a list of, of interesting examples which, which could be interesting cones to look at. So they, they in this uh, software Hypatia, there are more than two dozens uh, of predefined uh, cones, which are not the five standard cones, and which they call a bit more exotic cones, and we'll see some examples. So there are certainly uh, many more cones that one can't look at, and it's, 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 it's fair enough to, to argue that um, there, there can be some value in practice uh, you know, of using these cones. What I also feel like mentioning, and uh, well, there was a question before that went into that direction in the literature. Um, what, I, what I feel like uh, noting here is that uh, we often also find the completely positive, the co-positive, and the doubly non-negative cone, which are all non-symmetric cones, and especially they are not contained into the the wheel of five uh, standard cones, if you want to run, if you want to call them standard cones um, so what do some of these cones uh, look like there's for example the infinity norm cone um, so this is this is quite similar to the to the uh, quadratic cone 
um, if you if you look at that, it's just that basically you you what you do here is you change the norm that appears in the definition of the quadratic cone. So this is something that seems to pop up in applications sometimes, and it's it's uh, still a cone. It's non-symmetric, but it's still a cone that you might want to look at. Um, in one of these slides on the exponential cone, we had seen how to model entropy, in particular one-dimensional entropy. And you can generalize that to so-called d-dimensional entropy, um, which would be uh, this here, or relative entropy, uh, which would be this. Um, and you can, you can define a cone that makes you directly model uh, relative entropy in, in d-dimensions. So this is another example where you can, uh, well, by, well, by allowing yourself to use a more exotic cone, you can model something that you could do already with the exponential cone, but with maybe additional, uh, or well, with additional equations, uh, at least in d dimensions, that would be true, uh, that you can model more directly if you have a new cone. Um, there are many matrix cones actually. So if you if you want to look at it in this way, there is some of a, at least from 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 the practical standpoint. So if we go away from this complete formalization of the standard form of the conic program, then there is somewhat uh, these two lines of, of matrix cones and vector cones maybe. And there are many examples of matrix cones that can have uh, that can ha make sense for several applications. Uh, as an example here, we have the so-called the spectral norm cone. Uh, so the, the spectral norm is a norm that is uh, defined on matrices via uh, singular, so-called singular values. So the, um, a pair of a, a, a number and a matrix uh, is in the spectral norm cone. If this number is greater than the, uh, the, um, the greatest singular value of the matrix X, X for example, uh, there are the other, other examples from matrix cones are the root determinant cone, log determinant cone, uh, sum of squares pops up. You might have heard some of these things. Uh, they all have some connection to cones or there are cones that model these things directly. And um, now also to give an example of what we saw on the previous slide that, um, well, maybe uh, forcing yourself to use a restricted set of cones uh, forces you to do some reformulation and that somehow increases the, the dimension of your problem. Uh, that is maybe, uh, that is more crucial when you, when you, when you uh, work with matrices. Um, also the question we had about doubly non-negative cones before goes very much into that direction. Uh, here's another example. Uh, if I have a, a pair of axes in the spectral norm cone, uh, you can show actually that you can you can model the exact same thing. Uh, it's, it's a convex thing. So as we know that we can basically model a lot of things with only five cones. It's quite intuitive that there is some reformulation of this using using one of the five cones, uh, most likely the semi-definite cone. And there is actually, so these two things are precisely equivalent. But what you can also see is that whereas before, we worked in a space which was basically D1 times D2. Uh, now we, we blew, this up, uh, blew this up a bit. So now we, we are in the uh, D1 plus D2 uh, dimensional symmetric matrix cone. Um, but the, the dimension basically doubled with respect to before. So this, this, is, this is one example of, 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 of why it is also valid to ask whether you would not want to look at more cones uh, so that you can model different things in different ways. Um, so if we, if, we, if we want, we could, we could talk about something like the extended conic wheel. Um, so I, I, yeah, I put it around here. I don't name all of them because it's, uh, there, there are also many other examples, a lot of norm cones, matrix cones, other exotic things. These can all be things which uh, which complete this this wheel of uh, standard cones, and and then uh, there's there's when you want to design software for for that, um, then like I said, Mosaic has has chosen one path somehow, but there there are, are other path uh, paths 
that you might choose. Um, yeah, I listed some software here. Um, uh, yeah, maybe I, I should go through it somehow quickly. So, uh, and it's it's likely not to be a complete list. Uh, I might have forgotten something. Um, what I feel like naming here is well, certainly Mosec is is, is now specifically somehow uh, designed for for conning optimization, and it preci precisely supports the five cones we have seen uh, in some cases, or in almost all cases, with mixed integer support. Uh, when it comes to STP solvers, uh, there is maybe a bit of a, a longer history than for solvers for, uh, well, let's say non-symmetric cones. So there are many uh, packages which uh, let you solve STPs. Uh, some of them also let you solve uh, uh, quadratic cone problems. Uh, this is somehow because these two cones are symmetric and handling them uh, in, in a software is somehow so when you build a software for handling the STP cone then it's not so hard to extend it um, to handle also uh, the quadratic cone and that's that's because they they share this property of being symmetric cones um, yeah what one should mention is that uh, nowadays uh, the, the leading MIP solvers uh, they also support uh, SOCP modeling or mixed integer SOCP modeling um, so it's it's it the, at least for the for the quadratic cone conic modeling is something that has found their way into into this very popular po uh, software packages as well. Yeah, there's some more SCS ECOS. We talked about uh, mixed integer STP. There's a module in Skip uh, for that. Um, I feel like mentioning this. Uh, well, Hypatia I, I named before takes more of a different path, uh, going towards generic conic programming. Um, another Julia package, which, which might be interesting, is this uh, so-called Pajarito package, which is basically an auto approximation framework for, it focuses more on the mixed integer part of the conic programming world. And then there are also some modeling tools which, uh, which specifically allow you to use cones, even though not exclusively. So uh, these three here are, are, are well, also for more general convex or even non-convex optimization, but they also uh, support cones. Um, yes, so this concludes this part about application examples and and some of this this uh, picture of all of all the cones or at least all the the categories of cones that that one might encounter today um, as a good reference, this sounds a bit like self marketing uh, I would uh, mention this uh, well the so called mosaic modeling cookbook. This is a, uh, um, a, a collection, basically, of modeling tricks that we update continuously and which is uh, freely available on the Mosec website. So if, if you're interested in that, then just go to the Mosec website and you will, you will, you will uh, find a way to get a free copy of this book, so a digital copy. Um, and it's, it's, it's really something, it's not necessarily, uh, so we explicitly uh, did not design it in a way so that it lures you into using Mosec. It's really something that is intended to lure you into using conic optimization. So there's not a, a single code snippet, for example, in this book. So it's a real modeling book, uh, a, ma a math book, if you wish. So it's not, it, it doesn't show you how to code things uh, using Mosec itself, but it, it really shows you how to do uh, conic optimization. Um, then there are some more references uh, that I listed here that I also referenced uh, during the slides before. Okay, uh, yeah, that concludes this part about uh, modeling. Um, uh, the next thing we're going to look at is maybe a quite more, uh, a slightly more technical. Um, so before that was very applied, um, now it's a bit more technical. Um, there is some there is some some formulas also uh, that, that that we will go through now. But uh, this is a bit like I said before. The aim here is not that you that you follow all of the steps in detail that I'm going to show you in a bit, but it's more like that I'm going to pinpoint really some two or three important points that I think are 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 um, well nice nice uh, takeaway messages. Um, 
of the important things, which, well, uh, if you think about linear programming, and we have started all this saying that uh, conic programming is some sort of an extension of linear programming, where we have this powerful duality theory. And now we're going to see how, how that extends to the conic case. And it is really quite similar. So it's, it, I personally really like this uh, conic duality theory. Um, well, you can like it or not. What I, what I want you uh, to see also though is that there are some, some caveats, so some corner cases that one has to take care of. But I think you can also uh, see them quite nicely if you, well, if you bear with me uh, going through this section a bit more slowly, maybe. Okay, so um, I'm going to start this, uh, well, de departing from Lagrange and duality theory, uh, which is something we can apply also to the uh, um, general nonlinear optimization problem. So this is also a means of differentiating the conic framework a bit from the general convex uh, framework. Anyway, in the in the general convex uh, framework, uh, when you look at Lagrangian duality, well, Lagrangian duality you can you can see it as some means of transforming a, con a constrained optimization problem into an unconstrained optimization problem. And how do you do that? Well, you take vectors mu and lambda. You multiply them uh, with your with all the expressions that describe your feasible set, and you put all this into the objective function. So that's how you uh, transfer uh, all the constraints uh, into into out of out of the feasible set. And you basically you have an unconstrained optimization problem. Uh, another way of looking at Lagrangian duality is uh, seeing at as some systematic way of deriving lower bounds for the optimal value of your optimization problem. So you define this dual function, uh, which is just the, the, the minimum, minimum over or the infimum over x of this uh, Lagrangian function. And you can, you can do all this uh, for general nonlinear programming. And what I would like to highlight here is that even in the general nonlinear uh, programming case, we have some, we, we have some well, some sense of what dual feasibility means. Uh, if you recall that this is this is somehow the the I mean the 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 scope of of doing Lagrangian duality is somehow deriving lower bounds uh, for your optimization problem. Uh, so what what um, jumps to your eye is that if this lower bound is just a trivial lower bound minus infinity, then it's not particularly interesting. And that is that is also how you can define a, a notion of of dual feasibility for nonlinear uh, programming. So that would basically be uh, um, saying I call such a pair of Lagrangian multipliers mu and lambda. I call them dual feasible only if they give me a non-trivial lower bound. Um, so linear programming now is a special case of, of uh, nonlinear programming in functional form, of course. If you just plug in the linear expressions uh, for in, into this generic form for nonlinear nonlinear programming that we have seen, uh, you can apply Lagrangian duality to, to duality to this in the same way. And the Lagrange function then looks like this. And now LP is so special because this whole notion of duality uh, can be deduced to a very, very explicit form, um, which is not necessarily the case for nonlinear functions. So you have you have a very explicit idea of what dual feasibility means. Uh, I did not do the derivation here. You can find that in standard textbooks. Um, but if you if you well if you if you want to analyze when this actually leads to the dual function g, which is which is not minus infinity, then you end up exactly with these conditions. So one of the reasons LP is special because you have an explicit form of duality. And now we're going to see that in the same sense, also conic programming is, 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 is almost equally special because you can, uh, you can narrow down the Lagrangian duality to an explicit form. So that that's that's very point where it it, it stands out from uh, from nonlinear programming. Uh, so how are we how are we going to do this? 
a crucial point I would like you to uh, note here on this slide is that uh, this one part of dual feasibility for linear programming, which says that this uh, dual vector lambda, which is the one that corresponds to, to the non-negativity of your primal variable vector x, it has to be non-negative. And that makes sure that this term here in the Lagrange function uh, with the minus in front of it actually is, is negative. And that guarantees that, that you actually get uh, lower bounds. So for any primal feasible x, you can check that this evaluates to something which is lower or equal than the primal ob uh, objective value of that primal feasible x. So this is precisely the reason um, why, why you have this part of the dual feasibility set. Uh, well, you have this part of dual, dual feasibility. And now we're going to do exactly the same thing uh, in the conic case. So in the conic framework, uh, not necessarily this can be seen as a special case of the, of the nonlinear programming problem. If, if, for example, your cone is not, it's, it's not described by, by a nonlinear function, maybe. Uh, but still, we're going to extend what we saw for linear programming by just, um, by just requiring that we have uh, dual variables lambda, which are supposed to correspond to, to this constraint, such that for any, su any such vector x, we get a negative quantity. Well, or, well you get a positive quantity when you multiply this lambda with x. Okay, so I'm not doing the derivation again, but uh, if, you, if you do this, then you basically can derive a conic dual just in the way you would do it for linear programming. And so now because this uh, condition here somehow stands out, um, we, we, we introduce a new notation for it. Um, so we look at this set, uh, when we have a cone K, we look at the set K star, which basically is just the set of all vectors such that the inner product of this vector with any vector in the cone gives a positive quantity. Uh, and, and well, the, it, it precisely comes from this fact, which we had seen somehow what it means in, in linear programming. So that, that's how we, how we come to this definition of the set K star, which by the way, can be shown uh, to be a closed convex cone, which would be true even for an original set K, which is not a cone. Uh, but we're not so much interested in that. So we start with a cone K. Uh, then when we form this set K star, uh, we, we, we again know it's a cone um, and we call it the dual cone. And, and what's remarkable now is that uh, by just doing this, we already know that the, the dual problem of a conic program will again be a dual problem because we, get, we have this condition on duality and it's again a cone. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, maybe I did not say what I wanted to say. The dual of a conic program will again be a conic program and that's precisely because the set defined in this way, which is exactly what you need, it is again a cone. Um, so. Yeah, I didn't do the, the derivation, but you can you can easily get there if you look into the textbooks. Um, the dual of the standard form conic program that we look at is precisely this. So it has an explicit form. It's 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 like linear programming. It's not like a nonlinear programming where uh, dual feasibility means that some abstract well not necessarily so abstract, but some function which for which though you may not know. A, an algebraic description uh, has to be uh, 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 has to evaluate to a finite value. You have it much more explicit here, and, and this is this is one important point in my in my opinion where conic uh, programming somehow is different from uh, uh, general nonlinear programming in functional form. Um, yeah, you can you can simplify it a bit. Um, I just uh, added these here for completeness so you can play around a bit with it. It's basically, uh, I wanted to show that you can, you can write the same thing as this. So you really go back to this ordering uh, that you define uh, with the dual cone. Uh, you see that in textbooks quite frequently. So 
uh, we always use the standard form here where we always have that some vector should lie in a cone but if you if you go back to the very beginning where we where we defined orderings via cones uh, what you often see is is uh, things like this so for completeness uh, um, we we see here that uh, you can uh, you can again make the notation a bit more compact um, yeah, an interesting thing also is that weak duality, uh, it comes for free. It's exactly like in linear programming. This is actually not so different uh, from nonlinear programming. Uh, also nonlinear programming, you get weak duality basically for free. That's not very hard. What's different now is the way we're going to establish strong duality. So if you know a bit about LP, then you might know that you basically have strong duality under, under well, the part, uh, in feasibility situations maybe, um, well, unboundedness situations, uh, you have strong duality. And in conic duality, we will also have strong duality in many cases. Um, and we will, we will see that in a bit. Uh, before that, I wanted to get back to the dual cone again. So we said now, well, this is already, this is explicit in the sense that um, it's again a conic program. Uh, you might argue that uh, well, this k though is maybe is, it's some set that is defined in some way. It's all the vectors that have a positive inner product with all vectors in the cone. So it's not necessarily if you have a very concrete way of approaching things, you might say well that's not that's still abstract. In many cases, you also have algebraic descriptions of the dual cone, and here are some examples. Um, so if you think back to the slide where we first talked about symmetric cones, one of the things that make up a symmetric cone is the fact that it's uh, self-dual, which now um, pops up exactly in this place. Self-duality means that the dual cone of this cone is the cone itself. Yes, yeah, so you might convince yourself also geometrically for this. Or if you think about the non-negative orthend, all the vectors that uh, form an acute angle with every vector in the non-negative orthend must lie in this non-negative orthend itself. So there is no way around being a self-tool for the non-negative orthend. The same reasoning somehow leads to seeing that the, the dual cone of the quadratic cone is the dual cone itself. And also the, the, the STP cone is self-tool. Uh, the exponential cone though is not self-dual. Um, uh, well, that's one of the reasons is also a non-symmetric cone. Um, you, can, you, can, um, you can derive uh, a closed form description, apart from the closure maybe, of the dual cone. It looks like this. It's a bit similar. It's slightly different though. And one can also see that in the picture. Actually, to be completely honest, this is not uh, so this is the exponential cone that I drew here. Uh, this is not precisely the dual cone, it's the so-called polar cone, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, well, it's, it's almost uh, the same uh, somehow. Uh, in any case, it's, 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 so this picture is just intended to show uh, that, or it's intended to make you remember that the exponential cone is not uh, symmetric because also it is not self-dual. Okay. Um, yeah. So now our goal in the next maybe uh, ten minutes or so or fifteen is still to 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 get a hold of the notion of strong duality. So we have seen that uh, we have weak duality for conic programming. But what about strong duality? And and uh, one way you can you can get there is first looking at uh, the so-called Farkas lemma, which is very important in the LP. Actually, also I think in and we will see that the the Farkas lemma on its own, not just for proving strong duality, it can it can be an interesting thing. Uh, also in the LP case, it's very interesting, it, and and it has practical implications. It it pops up, for example, in describing uh, valid inequalities for mixed integer linear programmings. So it's it's a thing that that is it's an object of interest on its own also. And I would like to uh, well 
recall what the Farkas lemma in the LP case is uh, with a picture. So we might uh, stay some minutes on this picture here. Um, Farkas lemma basically tells you that when you are in a situation where you have a linear program, so you have you have the input data, of course, you have A, B, um, and what you form then uh, is this blue set, script A is what I called it. It's basically, it's the space that is spanned by the columns of A if you allow for uh, weights that are non-negative or said differently. It's precisely the set of vectors that you can get by combining the columns of your matrix A, allowing for weights that are in the cone, <laughs> which in the linear case is just a non-negative orthend. So it's this blue set. And then what in Farkas lemma is important is also this green set, which can be seen to be the polar set of the script A. Um, it's just the set of all vectors that have a non-acute angle with all the vectors in the blue set. Uh, yeah, don't think too much about these uh, definitions maybe. Just for the moment being, we have the blue set and the green set. And now Farkas lemma is remarkable. It tells you that have, if you have a vector B, so that you're, you're one part of the input of your linear program, exactly two things can happen. So first thing, thing that can happen, if your B is in this blue set, which means nothing else than that you can find a non-negative vector X such that AX equals B, which means that your primal system is feasible. So you have, you have a primal feasible LP. If that is so, so if B is in the blue set, then certainly there will not be an intersection of the red set with the green set. So that means that there will be no vector that spans an acute angle with B. That's one thing that can happen. If it's not the case, so is, if B is outside of the blue set, then we will certainly have a non-empty intersection of the green set and the red set. So that's that somehow Farkas lemma in a picture. It's a remarkable result, result. Exactly two things can happen. Yeah, if you go back, if B is in the in the blue set, then the red and the green don't intersect. But if they intersect, then necessarily B cannot be in this blue set. So the primal system is infeasible. Yeah, that's how you how you how you create infeasibility certificates, and we will see that in a moment. So that's uh, Farkas lemma for the LP case. What's uh, important now in in the um, next but one slide, when I'm going to extend this uh, to to the conic case, is uh, the definition of this blue set. Yeah, so it's the column space of A that can be generated by taking weights which are in the cone that we look at at, at the moment. So it's the, it's 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 uh, one way of describing the primal feasible set. Okay, but we, before we get there uh, to the picture in the conic case, we look at the actual Farkas lemma in the in the conic case. And now th this seems technical, uh, but again, um, it's not so super important. I think that you that you go through this very carefully. What I want you to take home is that. There are, again, two possibilities, one and two, which are exactly the same as in the LP case. So the conic Farkas lemma is almost exactly the same as in the LP case, but there is some corner case, some caveat, which is the third case. So it's not always true that we either have one or two. There can be a third possibility, uh, which is this. So the, the, the first possibility was, our primal system is feasible. The second, uh, second possibility is, uh, was that we can construct an infeasibility certificate, basically. And now the third case is when none of these things is true. Uh, so in particular, the primal system is not feasible. B is not in this column space that we would like it to be in if we want a primal feasible system. But if it's not in there, it can happen that it's in the closure of the set. So that's somehow something that has to do with, with limits. Uh, we can also call it limit feasible. Um, 
we can call it limit feasible because B being in the closure of the set means um, that there is a sequence of points in the cone such that they converge to primal feasibility. They are not primal feasible itself because the primal feasible system, uh, the primal system is infeasible, but they converge to a feasible solution. Okay, so uh, to sum up this slide, what, what I think is important to remember is that when going from the LP to the conic case, there's, there's a third possibility, which is somehow a corner case. But the next slide is also to convince you that this is something that, that well, we, we uh, somehow should be able, if, if, we, if we say that we model in, in a reasonable way, then we should be able to exclude this corner case in practice. So let's look at, at a, a conic example. So it's now it's it's a bit similar to the picture we saw in the LP case, uh, but it's a conic example. Um, so it's a it's an it's an easy, uh, relatively easy conic program. We have a rotated second order conic uh, cone, con rotated second rotated quadratic conic constraint. To recall what that means, it just means that two times u times v must be greater or equal than W. But now if you look at our data here, V is fixed to zero. So certainly two times U times V for whatever U will be zero and thus certainly not greater or equal than one fourth, which is W squared. So it's straightforward to see that this problem as written down here is primal infeasible, okay? What we can also show is that the space, which is spanned by the columns of A, so any vector that I can generate by combining my columns of A, um, by, taking, by taking weights, which are constrained to lie in the rotated second order cone, or rotated quadratic cone, I don't expect you to do this now, you have to believe me on this, it's this set. So it's this right half space, the blue set again, uh, note that it's strictly positive here. So the W axis, actually it is not part of the blue set. The origin is, but the entire axis is not. And we see that the vector B now is not, is not in this set, it's not in the blue set because the boundary is not part of the blue set. So that precisely means it's primal and feasible. We knew that already. What we also see is that if we take the closure of the blue set, then B is in there. So that's, that's exactly the third possibility of uh, the Farquhar's lemma, okay? And now I would like to convince you why this, from a practical point of view, is actually something which is completely bad. So this is something that you would say, you would somehow like to model in such a way that this never happens because it's, it's, it's um, well, it leads to completely, uh, uh, it can lead to completely crazy practical implications. Um, why is that? So imagine that we change the input data just slightly. Uh, so imagine to do a slight perturbation of the input data, fixing V not to zero, but to some very small quantity, like uh, 10 to the minus six, say. Now suddenly you can take a very large Q, 10 to the six is enough, two times U times V will then be uh, two, so it's greater than one fourth. So your primal system uh, just now turned feasible. So what, what happened basically is that with a, a, a tiny perturbation to the input data, I turn my, my problem from primal infeasible to infeasible. And if you think about that from a practical point of view, that's completely crazy. You would never want to have this, that if you want to practically solve a problem, and tiny perturbations to the input data, which could just come from, for example, how you represent uh, real numbers in, in some uh, floating point arithmetic. If such tiny perturbations, which can be random, change your problem status from not being solvable, not being primal solvable, to being primal solvable, this is completely crazy. So you, you, would, you would certainly want to avoid this if you're a practitioner. So, so to, what, what, I, what I want to, to underline with this is um, that this is something we call ill post. So if you have a problem 
uh, where, where the third alternative of the Farkas lemma can happen, then maybe you should rethink how you model this problem. Because, because tiny changes could, could then change your ability to solve the problem or not, which is certainly something you would not want uh, to end up with in practice. So there are three possibilities and not two in the conic case, but we can also argue that if we somehow uh, do careful modeling, then we can almost recover exactly what we have in linear programming. That's also why, why we call this, this example, we would call such a problem ill-posed. Uh, because somehow it's not it's not nicely formulated, precisely because of this thing of tiny perturbations. Okay. Um, yeah, we're gonna stick a bit uh, with this example. I now again change a bit the input data. I fix v uh, not to zero now, but to minus one half. Uh, now, still, this is completely infeasible. Um, you will not have uh, two times u times v greater than uh, greater than uh, one fourth. Uh, we can see this in this picture. Also, b is now not in the blue set as before, but it's also not in the closure of the blue set. So this is really infeasible. So certainly we know from the conic Farkas lemma that we end up in the second case, um, which I which I want to uh, show now how to do, but not for the for the sake of showing that we certainly have the second case, but I also want to show you how we, how we can use the second case in practice. Um, so, well, the second possibility consists in finding a vector y such that two conditions are uh, are satisfied, which are these two. Um, well, if I take this y, which is which is uh, which looks like this, um, you can calculate that uh, y times b is one half, and minus y times uh, y transpose a is uh, this vector zero one zero. Uh, these are the two things you need to calculate for the second case of the Farkas lemma, and you can verify that this is a vector which is in the dual of the uh, primal cone, the dual of the rotated. Uh, quadratic cone is the quadratic cone itself. So two times zero times one is greater or equal than zero, um, which is what you need for the second case. So so this is how you how you construct basically a, an infeasibility certificate. Um, and, th and this is quite useful in practice. Um, um, infeasibility certificates are made in such a way that every row in your constraint matrix that is part of what causes the infeasibility in your problem will have a non-negative value. So you, you, in, in practice, this is sometimes quite helpful because you can, you can look at all the entries in this vector y in your certificate, which have non-zero uh, non values, and the rows that correspond to these entries uh, these are the ones that you you would have to examine in order to find out uh, why your problem is infeasible. So maybe when you made a uh, some some error in in implementing a model, uh, you end up with an infeasible model, though you know on paper that it's feasible. Uh, you might use these these tricks uh, to to do some debugging. Um, you can you can also in 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 conic programming it's it's one 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 powerful aspect of it. Uh, you can use these certificates usually for uh, optimality. You have certificates which you might want to use, or primal infeasibility as we saw here, or dual infeasibility as well. So that's one one powerful thing in the in the conic programming uh, framework. Okay, that was uh, Farkas lemma. Now just one slide on strong duality. So in the LP case, we have this very easy way of saying when the relation we have in weak duality, so the, the dual optimal objective is lower or equal than the primal optimal objective, this is actually almost always not a bound, but it's the same value. Uh, and it's enough that one of, one of these two problems uh, basically is, is, un, uh, is bounded, so it has a finite optimal objective. Then in the LP case, you have strong duality. Now, in the conic case, it's again, a bit like the Farkas lemma, slightly uh, more technical. You just need a, regular, uh, a regularity assumption. So one one 
way of stating this is to to require this here. Uh, you have a strictly feasible point. Um, I don't want to go into the technicalities. The the takeaway really is that uh, you can establish strong duality. Uh, you just need some regularity assumption, which, by the way, is is somehow related to this uh, ill postness and well postness. So, like we said before on the Farkash case, if we end up in the third alternative, then something must be wrong with our problem formulation. Uh, this is the same here. So, this this uh, strict feasibility can be shown uh, to be closely related to the third alternative of the Farkash lemma. And in practice, that means if you solve a problem and you end up with a with a, a positive, strictly positive duality gap, so you don't have strong duality, then that might be an indication that something with your problem formulation is not so 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 luckily chosen uh, and you might want to change it in order to have something which is more robustly solvable okay yeah some references for for duality um, so I took this Farkash lemma for example from from this uh, this is a book chapter a very good book it is also a long book so uh, there's a lot of, of material in here, uh, Convex Optimization by Boyd and Vandenberger. Um, there, inside there, there's a lot of duality theory for general convex optimization, so on functional form, not necessarily convex also. Uh, but the conic case is often uh, pointed at as special cases. So uh, in this book, you can find uh, nice chapters on, on well, especially especially on duality, but many other things, um, both for the for the, for functional form, but also for conic form. Okay, and this concludes this uh, section about uh, duality. Um, yeah, I have a last section. Uh, there is some more time. Maybe um, I don't know. Maybe we take a, a one minute break to see if there is a question so far. Yes, uh, let's start with the continuous case. So if I have a continuous conic program, uh, how do I solve it? Uh, I'm not saying interior point methods are the only method. So especially when you think about STP, there are other approaches to solving STPs. But if I really talk about, if I talk about conic programming in its generality, then the method of choice is most arguably uh, an interior point method. So the interior point, uh, as I see it, is, is more like the, it's more like something. The thing you could talk about is the interior point scheme, which is a, a well a scheme that has many uh, degrees of freedom. So a specific, there might be many different interior point methods. They can come in many flavors because you can make uh, many different algorithmic choices. Um, the, the high-level scheme of interior point methods maybe works uh, a bit like the following. Uh, what you want to do is, if you have a somehow constrained optimization problem like this here, so you maybe you have linear quality constraints, they stand out because they are somewhat easy, but then you have, you have some uh, constraints that are just subsumed in the set script X, and and the idea behind the interior point scheme is that you transform this problem into an unconstrained, or no, unconstrained is not to to a li only linear equality constrained optimization problem because you might have reason to believe that you are better at solving that uh, rather than than solving the original problem uh, you looked at. So how do you do that? Um, well, you basically it's it's. In some sense, it's 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 a bit like Lagrangian duality, in the sense that uh, you somehow transfer the constraints into the objective function. Um, you have to have some 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 function f that somehow lets you do that. Uh, what you what you always want to have in an interior point scheme is a function f, which is somehow you can think of it as the indicator function of the dom uh, of the domain that you uh, want to stay in. So it must be some function that, if you evaluate it at a primal feasible x, uh, evaluates to zero, ideally. But if you evaluate it at an x which is outside of the domain you want to be in, then it should blow up. So you pay a very, very large penalty. So ideally, it's 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 uh, well, it's it it would be the indicator function 
of uh, of your domain. That is completely not tractable computationally, so that's why you not take indicator functions, but the idea behind this uh, is somehow that. And then, well, you, you weigh uh, the linear part in the objective function with some parameter t, you get a sequence of optimization problems, and then interior point methods are somehow are a, a clever way of, uh, of, of, of approximating this central path which is defined by the optimal solutions to all to this sequence of optimization problems. And if you do everything nicely, then this will converge uh, to the optimal value of your original problem. So uh, yeah, this is, this is very high level. What's important here now is, is this function f that you somehow need. And if we want to apply this scheme to a conic program, then what we, what we need is somehow we need to choose this uh, this this uh, function f. Um, not only in conic programming, also for general convex programs, you call this a barrier function. Um, and like I said, uh, you, uh, you can think of it somehow as a continuous approximation to to the indicator function of some domain. And um, this is also now somehow related to to a thing we talked about before. Um, when you introduce a new cone, then it's not like you just define the cone and everything will work out perfectly. I'm not saying it will not work out, but at the very least, what you have to do is you have to find a good, a good well, you have to define a way of handling this cone, which for interior point methods mean you have to find a good barrier function. Oh, uh, sorry. Oh. Um, you have to find a good uh, barrier function. Um, in theory, well, very much coming from theory, there's this notion of, of self-concordance. Actually, you would also like to, your barrier functions to be logarithmic and homogeneous. So there, there are some, some properties of, of uh, barrier functions which are desirable in theory. And these are also the ones you would use in practice probably. So like I said, I'm not saying that when you have a new cone, that it's impossible to, to find a good way of handling it, but it's also, it, it, it that certainly does not come from alone. So you have to, to find such a function, um, and then, then you have also to find an at least a uh, somewhat good way of, of, of handling that in floating point arithmetics and so on. So this, is, this, this, this points somehow at this two philosophies that we saw before. Um, in, in MOSIC, we concentrate on few cones, uh, for now, uh, for 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 whatever reasons uh, we might have, but you might also do it differently. But if you do so, then 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 you, you somehow have to have to have means to 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 handle uh, the issue of of having barrier functions. So if you want to have completely generic cones, then well, at the very least, uh, you have to specify a barrier function for that cone. So uh, this 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 points back a bit to these two philosophies. Um, something I would like to mention, um, which it also has it has practical implications. So I have been I, I have been asked this uh, also a couple of times. Um, what what um, some interior point methods uh, that that have been implemented for conic programming do is they don't necessarily solve uh, the the primal model. Uh, so they are, they of course they 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 implement some primal dual method for the the primal dual pair of a conic program, um, but in a way, uh, in a way that they they treat a somehow different model. So in in MOSIC, for example, we use this what we call a homogeneous model, or in other approaches, um, you sometimes hear talking about the self dual embedding, which is uh, very similar. It's not exactly the same, but the idea is the similar. Uh, the idea is, is, is the same, basically. Um, what you do is you have you have a you transform your your uh, initial uh, conic problem basically to a conic feasibility problem that somehow describes um, the the primal and the dual at the same time. So it lives in primal and dual space at the same time. Uh, so it's, in a, it's somehow it's uh, it's a transformation of your original model. 
why this is nice is because you can you can exploit again uh, conic duality theory uh, to basically show that uh, exactly three things can happen when you solve this feasibility model. So you can read basically from from uh, the optimal solution values of these uh, auxiliary variables tau and kappa. You can read uh, the problem status. So it can either be optimal, which you can read by just checking these values. It can be primal and feasible. Um, or it can be ill-posed. So it's it's essentially uh, it's essentially somehow it's the three three possibilities of the Farkas schlemmer uh, that you see inside here. So that's it's uh, one thing about this is that it's a, it's a, a nice um, it's a nice way to show how how all this duality, uh, conic duality theory can have an impact on practical implications. Uh, because in, in Mosaic, for example, this is this is what 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 uh, we actually make use of. Um, Another thing I, uh, I would like to mention here is that it it uh, it, it somehow is also different uh, because your uh, your iterates iterates in the interior point method they will not be primal feasible so that you might see that a bit as a drawback um, um, any any iterate of the interior point method applied to this model will be primal uh, feasible. To this model, which is does not uh, imply primal feasibility to the original model, but just to this homogenized uh, homogen homo homogenized uh, model, so that maybe drawback, but but um, the practical advantages which come from conic duality, uh, they usually outweigh this. Um, okay, and then uh, well, there's this uh, last slide I have. Uh, on interior point methods for conic programs, and this goes back a bit to this to this difference between symmetric and non-symmetric cones. Uh, so I try to highlight that a bit. That uh, symmetric cones ideally are the ones you would you would uh, you would like to have to do with, um, and that is because interior point methods for symmetric cones are more extensively studied and, and much more robust. If we, if you go to the publications um, introducing interior point methods for symmetric cones, they they date back much further than for non-symmetric cones. And um, this is there are some reasons for that, uh, which ultimately lie in in these two properties that define what a symmetric cone is. So I didn't I didn't go into them in detail. Um, uh, what, I, what I would like to mention just is that um, uh, when you when you treat symmetric cones, uh, they are they are mathematically somehow nice. Uh, what you what you can sh do with symmetric cones is actually that you can equip them with a, a so-called Jordan algebra, with which you can perform many uh, uh, on paper many nice transformations, and uh, one consequence of that is actually that. Uh, the so-called centrality condition, which is something you you solve in every iteration of the Newton method uh, inside the interior point scheme, uh, that actually reduces to a KKT system. So that is somehow it, it somehow has nice properties, really on paper, that also make it make it nice somehow uh, when you actually implement this. Um, so Nemirov, Nemi, Nemirovsky, for example, he he, he coined this. Uh, this, these, well, a series of uh, algebraic manipulations you can do to symmetric cones. He coined this as one of the few touching points of convex optimization and modern mathematics, because it, there's some, some, some. If you go through the theory, there's some really nice things uh, you can do. And, uh, for example, this this reduction of the centrality condition to the KKT system. This is not something we currently know how to do for non-symmetric cones. So um, it's again, I don't have a counter example, but um, as far as I know, nobody knows how to do these nice transformations for non-symmetric cones. Also for symmetric cones, something that somehow works nice in practice is the so-called, uh, you have something called an ester of thought scaling, which does not extend to non-symmetric cones. And these are really, really things that impact uh, also software development for, uh, for um, symmetric or non-symmetric cone optimization. 
so in Mosec, uh, when we introduced the um, the two non-symmetric cones around two years ago, that was at least internally a, a real breakthrough because it's it's uh, for the way we we implement the interior point stuff in Mosec, um, it's not necessarily so straightforward how to build a robust and reliable and performing algorithm for these non-symmetric cones uh, when comparing it to the symmetric cones. Um, okay. Yeah, some references. Oh, I said that here. The first, so these are, this is somehow uh, a bit of the history, if you wish, about uh, interior point methods for conic optimization. The first two are precisely about symmetric cones and they date back a bit more than the very recent activity actually, uh, which we have on non-symmetric cone optimization. Um, okay, some words about the mixed integer case, um, which, is, which is something uh, I actually work on a bit more uh, personally. Um, this is also exciting, but with respect to uh, to the continuous case, maybe even more fresh. So it has not been so many years that, that people tried to study these things and, and develop uh, robust algorithms. Um, if, you, if you think of a cone as being described by, uh, by some, some function, so some condition involving uh, a function, then you might see it as a special case of mixed integer nonlinear programming in functional form. So again, then when you go back to STPs, then that's not necessarily the case. But so let's just say intuitively, you might you might uh, expect that many of the of the solution approaches to mixed integer nonlinear programs can be extended to the conic case, and uh, that is probably true. Uh, um, what stands out though are two of the approaches. So what 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 has been written about and what I know uh, is used in practice is uh, well straightforward extend, extension of the branch and bound method uh, for mixed integer linear programming in mixed integer nonlinear programming called nonlinear branch and bound. Uh, it's basically the same thing here. You could just call it conic branch and bound. So it's just a straightforward way of solving mixed integer problems of, of this uh, form. Uh, you just solve continuous relaxations and then you start branching and solve continuous relaxations in every node of a branch and bound tree. Uh, what you also can do is uh, you can perform out approximation. And this is uh, this is one example uh, which is which has some nice structural insights also, which is why I'm going to go through that in the next slide. So out approximation is uh, also extensively uh, employed in software implementations for mixed integer nonlinear programming, and also in the conic case. This is somehow it's 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 uh, getting more popular, I would say. So in uh, mixed integer nonlinear programming in functional form, you have these so-called gradient cuts uh, that would that you would use uh, for approximating your nonlinear set. So basically, first-order Taylor approximations. And now in conic outer approximation, uh, what we can do is uh, we can use the so-called polar cone. So I think this is a nice example uh, of how you exploit conic structure. Uh, so that's 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 uh, why uh, I wanted to show it. Again, it's not it's not uh, too important to go through through these in very much detail. Um, what is nice here is that uh, well, basically, uh, if you have a cone, we already know that we can define the dual cone, and now the polar cone is is something which is not much more complicated. If you know the dual cone, then you also know the uh, polar cone because it's just the uh, the negative of the dual cone. And now if you go back to the definition of the dual cone, it's, uh, well, it's the set of vectors that all have a non-negative inner product with elements in the cone. And flipping that around means that I can describe my cone as the set of vectors that have a non-negative product with all vectors in the dual cone or since the dual cone is the negative of the polar cone, it just means uh, flipping the sign around. So in case you, you didn't see that so directly, you just have to believe me that um, 
this is a way of describing your cone. And now if you have a point, for example, x hat, which is not in your cone, so in the order approximation scheme, that would mean you have a point which you would like to separate from your cone. You would, find to, you would like to find a linear inequality that approximates your set, your cone, and that is violated by this uh, x hat. And basically, uh, this, this characterization above tells you that you can, you can take any point in the polar cone, basically, to do so. Um, so behind this is a bit that um, you have, a, you have a, 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 a somehow more explicit way of describing the set that approximates um, your, your, uh, your actual feasible set. So, for example, if, if you have a cone which can be described by functional form, then this gradient cut, which is uh, the thing you would do in mixed integer nonlinear programming, it can be seen to be just one choice of such a separator from the polar cone. But there might be many other choices. So, uh, one thing you, would, you might want to do is solve uh, somehow uh, this, this maximum uh, violation problem, which you can do in generality. Um, actually, um, for the five cones, uh, that, that make up our conic wheel, so the five standard cones, um, this is easily, this is easily doable also in practice. So one can show that this, uh, maximum, um, violation problem is actually, it's, uh, it's, well, if you write it down and work it out, it's the dual of the projection problem. So it's like projecting the point you want to separate onto uh, your cone. And now for our five cones, it's tur it turns out, for example, that this projection problem is very, is, is very easy. For the symmetric cones even, you can do it algebraically. So this is again a, a point where symmetric cones and non-symmetric cones are somehow a bit apart from each other but it's it's remarkable that uh, for symmetric cones because you have so you, this is this is a nice example of how you exploit structure you can algebraically uh, project any point in the vector space r to the n onto one of the symmetric cones if you wish for the uh, for the two non-symmetric cones in the conic wheel it's a bit more difficult, but uh, you can also show that that uh, in practice is relatively easy because you can you can reduce it to a univariate root finding problem. So this is, I think, uh, a nice example of how you of how you can exploit structure in order to to devise well components or maybe solution paradigms for mixed integer uh, conic programming. Um, so if you, if you remember to one of the very first slides, we said that exploiting structure is one thing that we would like to, um, that we would like to, to do in any, any mathematical programming paradigm. And there, there is some evidence um, from, from my personal point of view that in mixed integer conic programming, um, maybe this is, this is uh, one thing that is actually fruitful. So there are, there are uh, recently some, in, in actually, uh, so in the, in, in the research of mixed integer conic programming, I mean, there are more and more results that go into that direction. This exploitation of structure can actually also be twofold. So we could either exploit the structure of having a cone. So we could try to exploit uh, things that we know for a general cone, or it could also be uh, that we exploit the very specific structure of one fixed cone. So this goes a bit into the direction we had before. When you when you focus on few cones, uh, then maybe um, if you, if you want to look at them one at a time and try to design specific things that work good for this particular cone, um, then 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 that's one reason where not having too many cones is certainly of an advantage. So one thing that goes into this direction is this paper by Chai Pollock and Terlaki. Uh, from two years ago, so it's it's uh, it's relatively uh, new. I think it, the title is something like the first heuristic uh, specifically designed for mixed integer second order cone programming. So if you think about that, that's it's remarkable. There are for mixed integer linear programming, there's an arsenal of heuristic techniques that have uh, that have uh, very much impact onto the practice of solving such problems. 
And now the first heuristic specifically for mixed integer quadratic programming uh, is just two years ago. And so far, I don't know if there are other ones. Maybe it's, it's still the first so far. For the exponential contracts, I'm not aware of any, of any heuristic, so a primal heuristic for mixed integer exponential cone programming, for example. So this is relatively fresh. Uh, there are many things you can do. Um, and at this point, I, I usually also, I advertise this a bit as a research area. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, I think there are, there, are, there are many, many interesting things you can do. Uh, in fact, I, I went to a workshop on mixed integer nonlinear programming uh, some years ago, which had this title. Uh, it was something like uh, MINLP, uh, which is a hatchery for modern mathematicians. Uh, so if that's true, then I would say maybe a bit uh, provocative that if MINLP is for um, hatchery for modern mathematicians, then maybe mixed integer conic programming is uh, so, or even more so. Um, so this is also a, bit, uh, a slide that, that um, tries to lure you into considering mixed integer conic program as a research area. Um, yeah, I had two slides with just uh, two examples of some points that I had on the previous slide, uh, but I skip it. Uh, this very last slide is again, a bit this uh, mixed integer conic programming as a research area, and I'm going to conclude with that. Um, a few weeks ago, yeah, not so much time ago, there was this this discussion on uh, OR Stack Exchange. So you might have seen this this uh, relatively new forum on operations uh, research, and the user asked the question, um, well, what are the things that contributed most to the to the performance, to the speed, to the success of mixed integer uh, programming over the past decades, and what's going to contribute over the next decade? And of course, this aims a bit at these two driving horses, uh, which we always name, which are computing power, but also better algorithms. These are the two things that enable us to uh, to solve mixed integer programming problems better. And Often this is often this is specifically uh, argued for mixed integer linear programming, um, but also for for mixed integer nonlinear programming or conic programming. This is certainly true. So this discussion then it, it went on a bit on Twitter, and the conclusion was somehow that uh, mixed integer conic programming is 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 it's relatively fresh. Uh, so certainly it's an exciting area to do research, but it's also something that will certainly improve the more research is done and the more theory we have but also the more practice we have because that leads to practical experience and to more instances and so on. So uh, yeah, the conclusion here is somehow um, um, to suggest uh, you to consider mixed integer conic programming um, as a research area in terms of, of algorithms, but also uh, you may consider it um, for your next uh, mixed integer optimization application. Okay, uh, yeah, there is a bit of literature here, uh, which you might go through. I think uh, the slides, by the way,